Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Ah, listen to that quiet descend upon the room. Um, I'm Robert Benny. I'm the director of the Center for Religion and Society, which is one of the sponsors of this great event, along with others that are listed in your bulletin. But we did list Second Presbyterian, which should have been listed, and Second Press also contributed to this event, and last night hosted the bishop for two wonderful lectures. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Roanoke College community uh, to this very significant and unique event. A biblical scholar is drawing a crowd like this on a Friday night. This may not only be the largest crowd ever assembled in the Roanoke Valley to hear a biblical scholar, but that scholar is drawing such a crowd at the same time that Virginia Tech is playing Illinois in a nationally televised basketball game. We congratulate you, Bishop Wright. <laughs> Seriously, we want to host and welcome an event like this at Roanoke College because it's wholly consistent with our mission as a college. Lutherans have historically affirmed serious scholarly study of the Bible, and this college has always found room for that kind of study and a prominent place in its offerings for the study of the Bible, Christian theology, and Christian history. Nicholas Thomas Wright is not unknown among our students and faculty. In fact, he's known by many of our students and faculty. I would like to now introduce Dr. Gerald McDermott, professor of religion, who will introduce Bishop Wright. Dr. Gerald McDermott has been at Roanoke since 1989 as one of our most accomplished teachers and prolific scholars. He has authored scores of articles and eight books, the latest of which has just been published by InterVarsity Press entitled God's Rivals, Why Has God Allowed Different Religions? Dr. McDermott directs the Blakely Fund for Evangelical Studies, which is a major contributor to Bishop Wright's appearance this evening. Thomas Blakely, who some of you have known perhaps, was an energetic, civic-minded Christian here in Salem who made a major bequest to Rona College before his death in 2001 for this very purpose. So we remember Tom this evening. Dr. McDermott, would you introduce our guest speaker for the evening? We thank you for coming. And it's my great pleasure to, um, to introduce Dr. N.T. Wright. Now, Dr. Wright is the Bishop of Durham, which is the fourth ranking office in the Church of England. And this is an office that has been, re that has been reserved for centuries for a scholar bishop. And what a scholar he is. Uh, quite simply, he is one of the most influential biblical scholars in the world. His three published volumes on the history of the New Testament part of a projected six-volume series, I have begun to change the agendas for several fields of study, changing both the academies and the church's understandings of who Jesus was, what the early church meant by the gospel, and what St. Paul's message was. Uh, he is a leader, for example, in what is called the third quest for the historical Jesus. This movement of scholars is seeking to remind us that Jesus was a Jew, and so possessed far more of a Jewish outlook on God and life with God than most scholars have imagined. Bishop Wright is also a leader in what is called the New Perspective on Paul, which has argued that we have tended to look at Paul not through the lens of the first century, but rather through the lens of the Protestant Catholic debates of the 16th century. Now, the result is that Bishop Wright says, in fact, he insists, that we have typically misunderstood what Paul means by both justification by grace through faith and even the gospel itself. Now, I just mentioned three volumes. Bishop Wright has published 51 other books. In 2002, he published eight. In 2003, seven. 2001 was an off year. He published only three. One reason Bishop Wright has been so influential, not only in the academy, but also in the church, is that unlike many scholars, he writes with such clear and enjoyable prose. 
Uh, furthermore, he writes not only for fellow scholars, but also for non-academics. Now, his series, The New Testament for Everyone, uh, published in many different paperback volumes, uh, has provided readers with a short, easily understood commentary, verse by verse, on every book of the New Testament. Now, he told me today that he's going to take a week or two off and finish the commentary, or, or write, and I presume it means from start to finish, the commentary on Acts. Um, um, by the way, many of Bishop Wright's best books are on sale this week and starting tonight at the book table in the back. So uh, be sure to pick up a book on your way out. If, now, if Bishop Wright is an important scholar, he's also a widely traveled teacher. He has taught at Oxford, he's taught at Cambridge, he's taught at McGill, he's taught at Harvard Divinity School uh, and Regent College in Vancouver. Uh, but back to his current title, Bishop. Um, Bishop Wright is playing a significant role in the reshaping of the worldwide Anglican Communion, which is the largest single non-Roman Catholic church body in the world. The Windsor Report, a document that's at the heart of the reconfiguration now going on in the Anglican Communion, had Bishop Wright as one of its principal authors. And I just found out today there's another hat that Bishop Wright wears. He's a lord in the House of Lords. And I discovered that four or five times a year, for two or three days at a time, he goes down to London and he, you will, if you go there, you would find him engaged in matters of state as a legislator with his fellow legislators in Parliament. When he's not running a diocese and speaking and writing, uh, Bishop Wright enjoys music, uh, hill walking, uh, poetry, pastoral psychology, and golf. Now they say his golf, though, is nowhere as good as his writing. The bishop and his wife, Margaret Wright, have four children and two grandchildren. Now, before I ask Bishop Wright to come to the podium, let me remind everyone that this is the first of a series of four talks this weekend. The theme of the series is Jesus and Resurrection, Then and Now. There will be two more talks tomorrow morning at Church of the Holy Spirit in Roanoke, and Bishop Wright will preach twice on Sunday morning at St. John Lutheran in Roanoke. Uh, please see your handout for details. Now, Bishop Wright's lecture tonight is titled, Did Jesus Really Rise from the Dead? After he finishes his lecture, he will answer some questions. If you would like to pose a question, please write it out on one of the handouts that you were given and pass it um, um, to an usher just a bit later. Uh, please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Bishop N.T. Wright. Thank you very much, Jerry, and thank you all for your welcome. I'm relieved to say that though this computer had my lecture on when I left it here, it seemed to disappear when Professor McDermott was speaking, but it's now reappeared, so that's all right. <laughs> uh, Jerry mentioned my work in the House of Lords. I was in the House of Lords last Tuesday before setting off to come here in a debate which was started and wound up by the Lord Chancellor, which is one of the great offices of state in the British Parliament and when the Lord Chancellor is on official duty he wears some very splendid ancient robes which make him look like a figure from some century long past and it was about 25, 30 years ago I guess when Lord Hailsham was the Chancellor of, uh, of England that one day he came out of his office in the House of Lords dressed in all his finery and in the corridor, and there are many complex corridors around Parliament, he came face to face with a party of American tourists who were being shown around the place. And at the same time, behind the tourists, there opened another door, and a man emerged, was a member of Parliament, by the name of Neil Martin, who was MP for Buckingham at the time, and he was a friend of Hailsham's. And Hailsham wanted to attract Neil Martin's attention, so he raised his hand and shouted, Neil! And of course, the tourists all did. 
so you see the kind of reflections that an Englishman has coming from the House of Lords to address a bunch of Americans on a Friday evening in Roanoke. Thank you for your welcome. It's great to be here. Maggie and I are enjoying your wonderful hospitality. Uh, I have been asked to address tonight one of the most important questions that anyone can ever ask, that of what happened on the first Easter day. Perhaps predictably, we have to fight our way through some undergrowth even to get to the question itself. Part of the difficulty is the massive confusion that exists in our society today about the whole question of what the word resurrection itself actually means. And that is part of the confusion about what death itself is and about what we might be supposed to believe happens to people after their death. I observed this confusion in my own country in a number of incidents over many years. Think of the reaction of the public to the death of Princess Diana in 1997. It was a huge outpouring of grief, and I think I went on around the world. And people, when they wrote things in books of remembrance, and when they spoke on the radio or spoke to me as a pastor, they said all sorts of extraordinary things. God didn't have enough angels in heaven, so he called Diana to go and be another one. Or, when I look up at the sky tonight, there'll be a new star in the heavens, and that will be Diana. And I wondered, did they actually mean that? Was that metaphorical? Did they actually mean it literally? There's an enormous amount of confusion about death and what it means and what happens afterwards. And similar stories could be multiplied endlessly, and you will all have your own, I expect. And over in uh, this part of the world, I know that there are some people who report sightings of Elvis and that kind of thing. There's... <laughs> There's no accounting for what strange things people believe. And the enormous tragedies of September the 11th, of that Boxing Day tsunami in 2004, the New Orleans floods the following year, suddenly when people are faced with death and destruction, they start to ask questions and they assume they know what the church says about these things, but often they really don't. The church has talked endlessly about going to heaven as the ultimate goal of human existence. But many today find that the idea of sitting around on clouds, plucking at harps, or simply resting all the time, as some hymns imply, doesn't appeal today as it seems to have done to our forebears in an era of hard physical work for most people. And our hymns and our prayers have constantly emphasized, fit us for heaven to live with thee there. And he leads his children on to the place where he has gone. You open the hymn book almost at random and you'll find that that's the end of the game, is just to go to heaven. And so when people open the Gospels and find in Matthew's Gospel Jesus talking about people inheriting the kingdom of heaven, they assume within our contemporary culture that this means going to heaven when they die. But it doesn't. As Matthew makes quite clear, the kingdom of heaven is a way of talking about the sovereign rule of the one true God coming to pass on earth as in heaven. It's nothing to do with life after death or nothing very much. It's got everything to do with the purposes of God for the transformation of the life before death, life here and now and at the same time. For what I have called, and I think this is very clear, but people often find it confusing, so I'll explain it, what I have called life after life after death. Life after life after death. What is heaven after all in the Bible? Heaven is not an ultimate goal in the Bible. Heaven is part of God's created reality. It is God's space. And the point is that one day this heavenly reality is to be united with our world, with earth, transforming both of them in the present. That's what we're promised in the Old Testament and in the New. And if that is what we're promised, then the life that people will enjoy in that future world is not purely a heavenly existence. It's an existence in God's new heavens and new earth joined together. A life, a bodily life after whatever sort of life after death there may be. So how can we get our ideas sorted out? And how can we discover in the middle of all of this exactly what did happen three days after Jesus of Nazareth had been crucified? To get at this, I find it helpful to go back and ask, what did people in that world believe about death and what happened afterwards? Where did the early Christians' belief about life after death 
fit on the spectrum of what other people thought and believed. Now, I've set this out in much more length in my book called The Resurrection of the Son of God. It's the longest of the books that I've written that uh, Professor McDermott was mentioning. It's uh, just under 800 pages, I think, of text. And I have to tell you that when I gave it to my father, who was, I think, 84 at the time when it came out, he read it in three days flat, bless him. He's retired long since and has got nothing to do but read theology all day. What a wonderful life. And at the end of the three days, he phoned me up and he said, I finished it. And I said, you what? He said, I finished it. He said, and I'll tell you what, I really started to enjoy it after about page 600. So... <laughs> One of, one of the most interesting sideways compliments I've ever had. I, I said it's like, a, it's like a tree. It's got a large root system, and only with that root system is the trunk of the tree going to stand up. And so I'm just going to give you a tiny vignette of what's going on in that root system because you only understand what the disciples meant when they said Jesus is risen from the dead when you get your head round what that language meant in that culture. Now... What, did, what was resurrection and life after death doing in the ancient world, ancient pagan and Judaism? Well, as far as the ancient pagan world was concerned, the road to the underworld ran only one way. Death was all-powerful. You could neither escape it in the first place, nor break its power once it had come. And everybody in the ancient pagan world knew there was, in fact, no answer to death. The ancient pagan world then divided into those who, like the shades in Homer, might have wanted to come back and get a new body, but knew that they weren't going to. And those who, like Plato's philosophers, didn't want a body again, because being a disembodied soul, getting rid of the body, was a much better option. Within that world, the word resurrection never meant life after death. Resurrection always referred to a new bodily life back in this world again, after whatever had happened to you immediately after death, life after life after death. Now, the ancient pagans didn't believe that resurrection was possible. You know that story of the underworld, uh, going down to the underworld to find your lost bride, Eurydice, the lost bride, and Orpheus goes down to find her, and he's told that he's allowed to lead her back up from the underworld, but on one condition, while they're walking back up this long pathway, if he turns and looks to see his beloved again, then she'll be gone. So he goes down and he says, yes, okay, that's fine, and he's bringing her back, and halfway up this long path, his desire for his beloved gets the better of him, and he turns and he looks, and she's gone. And you see, it's a sad old myth, but it's a way of telling the story which says death is in fact a one-way street. We can imagine what it might be like for somebody to come back from the dead, but we know it doesn't happen. Actually, I found a poem recently which was a feminist retelling of that story in which Eurydice all the way up was whispering sweet nothings to him to make him look back because the last thing she wanted was a man in her life again. <laughs> so resurrection was a way of saying that's what would be a new bodily life after life after death, but we know it doesn't happen. Now, the ancient pagans knew about ghosts and spirits and visions and hallucinations. There's a lot of literature which describes those things. That's not what somebody means by resurrection. If you say it's a ghost, that's not the same thing as a resurrection. Resurrection means bodies. What about the ancient Jewish world? Now, there's a spectrum of belief there, too. Some Jews in the first century agreed with those pagans who denied any future life, especially a re-embodied one. The Sadducees, the first century Jewish aristocracy, are famous for taking this position. No future life, certainly not an embodied one. Other Jews, like the philosopher Philo, agreed with those pagans the Platonists, who believed in a glorious but disembodied future for a soul. But most first century Jews, so it appears, believed in an eventual resurrection. That is, God would look after the soul, after death, until the time when God remade the whole world, when, of course, he would give his people new bodies to live within that new world, life after, life after death. 
That is the world within which early Christianity burst upon the scene as a new thing, and yet not entirely new. What did the early Christians believe about what happened after death? What, where, what, did, what was their future hope? Where does resurrection fit in? How does it work? The early Christians didn't just believe in life after death. You know, often today people talk about believing in heaven and hell as one of the key shibboleths of being a Christian. I should apologize, by the way, to the signer. I have no idea how you si sign the word shibboleth, but I'm sure you're doing it really well. <laughs> I, Madam, had I known you were going to be there, I would have given you a, a copy of the script, and I'm sorry. There we are. Heaven and hell, however, is just a rough and ready way of saying something which in the Bible is more complex and actually more interesting. Because the early Christians don't talk much about what's going to happen immediately after they die. They talk more about the ultimate future when God's new world happens and people will be raised from the dead. When Jesus tells the brigand that he will join him in paradise next day, that very day, today you will be with me in paradise, Paradise cannot be the ultimate destination. Luke 24 makes it clear that Jesus, three days later, is raised from the dead. He hasn't stayed in that temporary holding place. When Jesus declares in John 14 that there are many dwelling places in his father's house, the word for a dwelling place in Greek doesn't refer to your ultimate home. It refers to a temporary wayside lodging where you go and stay en route for the final destination. The early Christians held firmly to a two-step belief about the future. First, death and what lies immediately beyond. Second, a new bodily existence in a newly remade world. Now, there's nothing remotely like this in paganism. This belief is as Jewish as you can get. But within this Jewish belief, there are seven, no fewer than seven, early Christian modifications, each of which crops up in a diverse range of Christian writers right across the first two centuries AD. And this is more important because what people believe about life after death tends to be very conservative. When you're faced with bereavement or grief, people lurch back for safety to what they have heard or learned from their families, from their traditions. But all the early Christians articulate a belief which in these seven ways is quite new. And this is the sharp point at which the historian has to ask, why? Why did they do it like this? Each of these, like everything I'm saying tonight, could be spelt out at much more length and indeed is in the big book to which I've already referred. So I'm just going to summarize them. The first of these modifications is that within early Christianity, there is virtually no spectrum of belief about life beyond death. There isn't a, a spectrum in which different people believe different things. Christianity looks to this extent like a variety of Pharisaic Judaism, not like Sadducees, not like Philo, certainly not like the pagans. The New Testament mentions some people who are muddled at this point, some who think the resurrection, the resurrection has already happened, but those muddles don't seem to have lasted very long. We have good evidence for early Christian debates on all sorts of topics, some of them fierce and sharply polarized, but virtually, virtual unanimity about resurrection. That's the first modification. The second modification is that in Second Temple Judaism, the Judaism of that period, resurrection is important, but it's not that important. Lots of lengthy Jewish works of the time never mention the question, let alone the answer. It's still difficult to find out what the Dead Sea Scrolls thought about resurrection or not. People believed in resurrection, but it wasn't at the center of their thoughts. But in early Christianity, Resurrection has moved from the circumference to the center. You can't imagine Paul or John without it. Belief in bodily resurrection, interestingly, was one of the two things that the pagan doctor Galen in the second century knew about the Christians. So there's this funny group of people, and they, 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 believe, they actually believe in resurrection. The other thing he knew about them, interestingly, was their remarkable sexual restraint. For them, resurrection was absolutely central. The third mutation within the Jewish worldview at this point has to do something with more organic 
about what resurrection actually means. In Judaism, nobody is very precise about what sort of a body people are going to have when they are raised from the dead. There's some confusion on that. You can affirm resurrection, but it's not clear whether it's a body exactly like this one or whether it's going to be something utterly, as we would say, supernatural and glowing or luminous or whatever. But from the start within early Christianity, it is built in as part of a belief in resurrection that the new body, though it certainly will be a body in the sense of occupying physical space and time, will be a transformed body, a body whose material created from the old material will have new properties. Particularly, it will be incorruptible, incapable of decaying or dying. That's the third mutation within the Jewish view of resurrection. The fourth mutation is that resurrection as an event has split into two. First century Jews expected the resurrection as something that would happen to all God's people at the end of time. The early Christians agreed that that would happen, but they said that it had also happened in advance to one person, Jesus, in the middle of time. There's no precedent for that in Judaism. The fifth mutation is what, in dialogue with me, the scholar and writer Dominic Crossan called collaborative eschatology. That's a wonderfully heavy-handed, clunky term. But what does it mean? The early Christians believed that if resurrection had begun with Jesus and would be completed in the final great resurrection on the last day, they believed, therefore, that God had called them to work with him in the power of the Spirit in the present to implement the achievement of Jesus and thereby to anticipate the final resurrection and to do this work in personal and political life, in mission and holiness, collaborative eschatology, something which has already started to happen, God's new world, God's new creation, and God now collaborating with his people in taking that project forward. That's a new thing in Christianity. The sixth mutation is the different metaphorical use of the word resurrection. When the word resurrection is used metaphorically in Judaism, it refers to the restoration of Israel after exile, as in Ezekiel 37. But from the earliest days of Christianity, that meaning has more or less entirely disappeared, and in its place we have a new metaphorical meaning of Christianity to do with baptism as dying and rising with Christ, and a new life of strenuous ethical obedience enabled by the Holy Spirit, a life to which the believer is then committed. Now again, metaphorical usages like that don't just happen. Somebody has reflected on what those words now have to do, the jobs required. This is a new thing from within Judaism, but a new thing that no Jews until the early Christians had ever imagined. And the seventh and last mutation from within the Jewish resurrection belief was its association with Messiahship. Nobody in Judaism had expected that the Messiah would die. So nobody imagined that the Messiah would rise from the dead. Yes, there are some Old Testament texts to which the Christians appeal, but it appears that nobody had read them in that way until the Christians came along. And this leads, you see, to a remarkable modification, not just of resurrection belief, but of messianic belief, which becomes rethought around Jesus and his death. No Jew with any first century regular understanding of messiahship could have imagined after his crucifixion that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed the Lord's anointed. But from very early on, the Christians said, Jesus is indeed the Messiah, precisely because of his resurrection. Let's just step aside from the argument for a moment, having got those seven, to make a hugely important point. You may not know it, but we have evidence of several other Jewish messianic or prophetic movements during the couple of centuries either side of Jesus' public career. Routinely, they ended with the death of the central figure. Members of the movement, always supposing they got away with their own skins, then faced a choice. If your leader has been killed, either give up the movement or get yourself another Messiah. Had the early Christians wanted to go the latter route, 
they had an obvious candidate, James, the brother of the Lord Jesus, who was a great and devout teacher. He was a central figure in the early Jerusalem church. For the first 30 years of Christianity, he was it. But nobody ever imagined that James might be the Messiah. Josephus, the Jewish historian, describes him rather contemptuously, but echoing the language that people must have used of him as the brother of the so-called Messiah. Now this means that we can already rule out some very common suggestions. Many have proposed that the early disciples were so overwhelmed with grief at Jesus' death that they picked up the idea of resurrection from their surrounding culture and clung on to that. Maybe he's been raised from the dead, maybe, maybe. And then finally persuading themselves it was true and then going out and telling people that it was true. Some have suggested that the earliest, Christians, the earliest Christians believed that after his death, Jesus had been exalted to heaven. And then they gradually started to speak about resurrection because of that. Or that they had a sense that they had to carry on his mission to bring in God's kingdom. And that that made them say he was raised from the dead. But would that make any sense? We can test it out with a little thought experiment. In AD 70... 40 years after Jesus' death, the Romans conquered Jerusalem and they led thousands of Jews captive back to Rome, back including the man they regarded as the king of the Jews, the leader of the Jewish revolt, a man called Simon Bargiora. Simon was led into Rome at the back of Titus's triumphal procession. And at the end of the spectacle, as everyone knew was going to happen, the king, the rebel king, the leader of the enemy, was flogged and executed. Now, supposing we imagine a few Jewish revolutionaries three days or three weeks afterwards, somehow they've managed to escape being killed themselves and they're in hiding. And one says, you know, I think Simon really was the Messiah and I think he still is. And the others are puzzled. Of course he isn't. The Romans got him. They killed him. That's what they do to people. If you want a Messiah, you better find another one. Ah, says the first. But I think he's been raised from the dead. What do you mean, his friends ask. He's dead and buried. Oh no, replies the first. I believe he's been exalted to heaven. The others look very puzzled. All the righteous martyrs, all those who have died for their faith, of course they're in heaven with God. Everybody knows that. The souls of the righteous are in the hands of God and there shall no torment touch them. Famous Jewish text. That doesn't mean they've already been raised from the dead. It means they will be one day. Resurrection isn't something that happens to one person in the middle of history. No, replies the first, you don't understand. I've had a strong sense of God's love surrounding me. I've found God forgiving me for running away. I've felt my heart strangely warmed. What's more, last night I really thought that Simon was there with me. And the others interrupt and they're now angry. We can all have visions. Plenty of people dream about recently dead friends or family members. Sometimes that's very vivid. That doesn't mean they've been raised from the dead. It certainly doesn't mean that one of them is the Messiah. And if your heart has been warmed, then for goodness sake, sing a psalm. Don't make wild claims about a dead man. That is what they would have said to anyone offering the kind of statement which according to the revisionists, the skeptics, somebody must have come up with at the beginning as the beginning of the idea of Jesus' resurrection. But this solution isn't just incredible, it's historically impossible. Had anyone said any of those things that revisionists have suggested, some such conversation as I've just given you would have ensued. A little bit of disciplined historical imagination is all it takes to blow away enormous piles of so-called historical criticism. What is more, to round off this seventh mutation from within the Jewish belief that I've just done a riff out of the side of, because of the early Christian belief in Jesus as Messiah, we find the development of the very early belief that Jesus was Lord and that therefore Caesar wasn't. That's a whole other topic for another occasion. But already in Paul, the resurrection both of Jesus and then in the future of all his people is the foundation of the Christian stance of allegiance to a different king, a different lord. Death is the last weapon of the tyrant. The point of the resurrection, despite much misunderstanding, 
is that death has been defeated. The tyrant's last weapon has been trumped. Resurrection is not the redescription of death. It is the overthrow of death. And with that, the overthrow of those whose power depends on their ability to deal in death. Despite the sneers and slurs of some contemporary scholars, it was those who believed in the bodily resurrection who were thrown to the lands and burnt at the stake. Resurrection was never a way of settling down and becoming respectable. The Pharisees could have told you that. Resurrection was always bound to get you into trouble, and it regularly did. So I have now noted seven major mutations within the Jewish resurrection belief, each of which became central within the Christianity of the first two centuries. The early Christian belief in resurrection remains emphatically on the map of first century Judaism rather than paganism, but from within Judaism, it has opened up a whole new way, unprecedented, of seeing everything, and this demands a historical explanation. Why did the early Christians modify the Jewish resurrection language in these seven ways so consistently? When we ask them, they of course reply that they did it because of what happened to Jesus. And this projects us on into the next part of the lecture, which is of course to ask, so what must we then say about the very strange stories which they tell about that first Easter day? When we plunge into the stories of the first Easter day, the accounts that we find in the closing chapters of the four canonical gospels, we find that the stories of Easter don't fit snugly together. How many women went to the tomb and at what point? And how many angels or men did they meet there? Did the disciples meet Jesus in Jerusalem or in Galilee or both? And so on. But surface discrepancies don't mean that nothing happened. Indeed, they are a reasonable indication, as any student of law court evidence will tell you, that something remarkable happened, so remarkable that it generated quick, rapid-fire tellings of the story, which were precisely not scrunched down so that they all agreed with one another, but were allowed to stand in their original vividness. I want to draw attention to four strange features of the stories about the first Easter day, which compel us to take them seriously as very early accounts. In the world of scholarship that I've inhabited now for many years, those of you who've studied any of that will know that there is a huge range of ways of suggesting that actually the Easter stories were fiction, that they were made up much later, that they come maybe from the end of the first century, some 40 or 50 or 60 years after the events. These four features, I suggest, indicate that on the contrary, these stories are very early. First, note what I call the strange silence of the Bible in the stories. Up to this point, all four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, have drawn heavily upon their old, the Old Testament, as we call it, the, the Hebrew Scriptures. They quote, they allude to passages, they echo bits of scripture in order to make it clear that Jesus' death was according to the scriptures. But the resurrection narratives are almost entirely innocent of such echoes, with only one or two small exceptions. And this is the more remarkable in that from St. Paul onwards, the common creedal formula declared that the resurrection too was according to the scriptures. And they are ransacking the Psalms and the prophets to show that the resurrection was intended by God all along. But why do the gospel resurrection narratives not do the same? It would have been very easy for Matthew or John or whoever to, to quote some texts that this strange event was fulfilling. Now, you could say, of course, that whoever wrote the stories in the form we now have them had gone through cunningly and taken material out to make it look as if they were very old, before anyone started doing biblical exegesis. Rather like someone going through a house and taking out all the electric fittings to make it look as if it was a, a pre-electricity early 19th century house or whatever. But the normal assumption among scholars that the stories grew up as late as the 80s or 90s of the first century would require us to say that. 
Now, that might be marginally plausible if we had just one account or if the four accounts were obviously derived from one another. Answer is we don't and they aren't. You have to imagine four very different writers each deciding to write up an Easter narrative, removing all the biblical echoes and allusions. Very silly. It's infinitely more probable that the stories, even if they were written down a lot later, go back to very, very early oral tradition, which had been formed and set in the minds of different storytellers before anyone had had any time for biblical reflection. The second strange feature of the stories is more often remarked upon, and it's the presence of the women as the first witnesses at the tomb. Whether we like it or not, and we don't, of course, women were not regarded as credible witnesses within the ancient world. Notice what happens already by the time Paul is writing 1 Corinthians, early 50s, say, when the tradition has had a chance to sort itself out and acquire fixed forms, Paul tells the story of what happened on the first Easter day, 1 Corinthians 15, and the women have been airbrushed out of the account. They've gone. They are apologetically embarrassing. But there they are in all four gospel stories, front and center. They are the first witnesses. Nay, they are the first apostles. Nobody would have made them up. Had the tradition started in the male-only form that we find in 1 Corinthians 15, it would never, ever have developed into the female first stories that we find in the Gospels. When we see Mary Magdalene at the tomb on Easter morning, we know that must have happened. Nobody would ever have made it up. The third strange feature is the portrait of Jesus himself. Many revisionists have tried to make out that the gospel stories developed either from people mulling over the scriptures and then imagining a resurrection or from an experience of an inner subjective illumination. But if that had happened, the one thing you would expect is for the risen Jesus to be shining like a star. That's what Daniel says will happen. That's what an experience of inner illumination might have generated. But interestingly, none of the Gospels say that about Jesus at Easter. Indeed, he appears as a human being with a body that is in some ways quite normal. He can be mistaken for a gardener or a fellow traveler on the road. Yet, the stories also contain, and this marks them out as among the most strange stories ever written, they contain definite signs that this body has been transformed. It's clearly physical. It has used up, so to speak, the matter of the crucified body, hence the empty tomb. But equally, it comes and goes through locked doors. It is not always recognized. One of the strangest moments in the resurrection stories is when, in John chapter 21, Jesus is cooking breakfast by the shore and the disciples come to shore and John says, None of them dared ask him, who are you, because they knew it was the Lord. Now, that's extremely odd. They'd been with him for three years, day and night. You don't say just a few days later, who are you? And yet there was something different, something very much the same and something very different. Now, this kind of account is without precedent. There are no biblical texts which predicted that the resurrection would involve this kind of body. It's a complete innovation. Why? The fourth strange feature is that the resurrection accounts themselves never mention the future Christian hope. Almost everywhere else in the New Testament, whenever you find mention of the resurrection of Jesus, it's spoken of in direct connection with the final hope that those who belong to Jesus will be raised as he has been raised, and with the note that this must be anticipated in the present in baptism and behavior. Now, I don't know how many of you here in this hall tonight are preachers, but I've heard lots and lots of Easter sermons which say something like, Jesus is raised, therefore there is a heaven and we'll be going to it after we die. Or, better, Jesus is raised, therefore God's new creation is a reality and we will one day inherit it. Interestingly, neither Matthew nor Mark nor Luke nor John say that. Oh, that's true, Paul says it, it's there in the New Testament, but not in the resurrection narratives themselves. In those narratives, it says, Jesus is raised, therefore he really is the Messiah. He is the world's true Lord. Jesus is raised, therefore God's new creation has begun, and we've got a job to do, and we better get on with it. Once again, had the stories been invented towards the end of the first century, this interpretation would certainly have included 
a mention of the final resurrection of all God's people. These four pointers, brief as I've given you them, mean that we can conclude that it is far, far easier to believe that the stories are essentially very early, prior to Paul's writings, and that they have not been substantially altered except for light personal polishing in subsequent transmission and editing. And Matthew's resurrection story is very Mathean. John's resurrection story is very Johannine. But this is like saying that here's a portrait which is obviously by Rembrandt, and here's a portrait which is obviously by Holbein, but they're of the same person, and they haven't made this person's nose a different shape. They haven't changed the color of their hair. It is still clearly the same portrait, even though by different artists. And this is the more or less universal witness of the early Christians. They were who they were. They told the stories they told, not because of a new private religious experience or insight, but because of something that had happened, something that had happened to the body of the crucified Jesus, and something that they at once interpreted as meaning that he was, after all, the Messiah, that God's new age had, after all, broken into the present time, and that they were charged with a new commission, something which made them reaffirm the Jewish belief in resurrection, not swap it for a pagan alternative, but introduce several distinctive but consistent modifications within that belief. And it's now time to ask in the third section of this lecture, what can the historian say about all this? I begin with what I regard as fixed historical points. The only way we can explain the phenomena we have been examining is by proposing a two-pronged hypothesis. First, Jesus' tomb really was empty. Second, the disciples really did encounter him in ways which convinced them that he was not simply a ghost or a hallucination. Let me just say a brief word about each of those, the tomb and the meetings. First, if the disciples had simply seen or thought they saw someone that they took to be Jesus, that without an empty tomb would not by itself have generated the stories that we have. Everyone in the ancient world took it for granted that people sometimes had strange experiences involving encounters with the dead, particularly the recent dead. There's plenty of stuff in ancient literature about that. They knew at least as much as we do, probably more, because in our post-enlightenment world we've screened it out and tried to pretend it doesn't happen. They knew at least as much as we do about visions and ghosts and dreams and the fact that such things often occurred within the context of bereavement or grief. They had language to describe such things and that language was not resurrection however many such visions they'd had they wouldn't have said that Jesus was raised from the dead they weren't expecting such a resurrection in any case this is a point people often ignore or conveniently forget Jesus was buried according to a particular Jewish tradition which was designed to occur in two distinct stages. First, you carefully wrap up the body with spices and linen and put it on a shelf in a cave. There'll be other shelves because you'll be coming in to bury other bodies. That's why you have the spices, because of the smell. But when the flesh of that body has decomposed, you then, and that might be six months to two years later, you then go back and you collect the bones and you fold them up in a prescribed order with the skull on top and you store them in a bone box, an ossuary. If Jesus had not been raised, sooner or later, someone would have had to go and collect his bones and fold them up and store them. Even if anyone had been suggesting that he'd been raised from the dead, doing that would be enough to disprove the suggestion. Any apparent meetings with Jesus that anyone has had would then have been dismissed. You've obviously just seen a ghost. Likewise, an empty tomb by itself without meetings with Jesus proves almost nothing. Tomb robbery was common in the ancient world, especially where somebody had been famous or conceivably somebody thought they were royal. People might have buried treasure with this person. 
In any case, many have suggested it might have been the wrong tomb, though a quick check would have sorted that out. It might have been somebody taking the body away, the soldiers, the gardeners, the chief priests, other disciples or whoever. That was the conclusion Mary drew in John's gospel. They've taken him away, and perhaps it was the gardener. That was the conclusion the Jewish leaders put about, according to Matthew. His disciples stole him away. All sorts of similar explanations could have been offered and would have been had not the empty tomb been accompanied by sightings of and meetings with Jesus himself. No. In order to explain historically how the early Christians came to hold the belief they did about those mutations in resurrection faith and then their belief that Jesus had been raised and that that was the generation of it, we have to say at least this, that the tomb was empty except for some grave clothes and that they really did see and talk with someone who gave every appearance of being Jesus. A Jesus who was strangely changed, more strangely than they were able fully to describe, but was very much alive, was very much embodied, very much with them. So the meetings on the one hand and the empty tomb on the other are each necessary if we are to explain the rise of the belief and the writings of the stories as we have them. Neither by itself would be sufficient. Empty tomb without meetings wouldn't do. Meetings without empty tomb wouldn't do. Put them together and they provide a complete and coherent explanation for the rise of early Christian belief. Is there an alternative explanation which would get us off the hook of saying that the ancient pagan view, resurrection is impossible, was wrong, along with its modern equivalents? No. I just want to note very briefly that the main alternative accounts, the revisionist proposals, lack explanatory power. Take the phenomenon of so-called cognitive dissonance. don't know if you've heard about that, but Quite a lot's been written about this over the last half century or so. Cognitive dissonance, as studied by social psychologists, is supposedly what happens when people want badly something to be true, but are faced with strong evidence to the contrary. And so they manage to leap over the data that point the wrong way, and they become even more strident in announcing their claims. Now that theory has some initial plausibility. There are some interesting examples from history of people behaving in that way. But theories like this cannot serve as an explanation of the early Christian phenomena. In fact, the research on which the original theory of cognitive dissonance by a man called Festinger and others uh, was deeply flawed, as I and others have shown elsewhere. But more particularly, it doesn't fit the state of affairs at Easter. The disciples were not expecting Jesus to be raised from the dead for the very simple reason they certainly weren't expecting him to be crucified. The fact that they were first century Jews and that resurrection was, as some people have said, in the air at the time, simply doesn't account for the radical modifications that they introduced into Jewish resurrection belief or for the astonishing features of the Easter stories that I've just laid out. In the same way, some have suggested that the early disciples had, as I said before, a new experience of grace, that they felt forgiven in a new way. They'd come to a new faith in the power of God, a new conviction that God's kingdom project was still going ahead despite Jesus' death. But that too simply won't work. If you had a new experience of grace, that doesn't take you one step nearer at all, saying that the leader that you'd followed had been raised from the dead. Judaism already had a rich language for uh, wonderful new spiritual experiences, and it doesn't include resurrection. There are many other smaller arguments that people have advanced from various angles. I've tried to study as many as, many as I can. Other scholars have written about these in more detail. I think of the work of Gary Habermas or of William Lane Craig, who've made lifelong studies of the kinds of arguments that people put up against the resurrection. Let me just summarize a few of them show that I haven't forgotten them. First, Jesus didn't really die. Someone gave him a drug which made him look like dead and he revived in the tomb. Answer, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a Roman historian. Roman soldiers knew how to kill people. That was their job. Uh, anyone who let a would-be Messiah or King of the Jews escape half dead 
would not survive very long themselves. And in any case, no disciple would have been fooled by a half-drugged, beat-up Jesus into thinking that he had defeated death and inaugurated the kingdom of God. Second, I met this in a book not long ago. When the women went to the tomb, they met somebody else. And it was one of Jesus' family, maybe James, who was Jesus' brother, so he looked a bit like Jesus. And in the half-light, they thought it was Jesus himself. Sorry, they would have noticed soon enough. Third, Jesus only appeared, I often meet this, Jesus only appeared to people who already believed in him. That's simply wrong. The disciples were not expecting that he would rise from the dead. And particularly, Thomas in John 20 and Paul on the road to Damascus very firmly didn't believe and had to be convinced despite themselves. Fourth, people often say, well, the accounts that we have are all biased. They're all written by Christians, so they would say this, wouldn't they? Answer, so is all history and all journalism. Every photograph is taken by somebody from some angle. There is no such thing as a point of view which is nobody's point of view. Saying that this account is written from a point of view just says it's an account. Now let's discuss its content. Lots of others. And perhaps the most popular, what actually happened, some people say, was that they had some rich spiritual experience and that they thought that Jesus really was alive spiritually and that they were still in touch with him. That is simply a redescription of a noble death followed by a platonic immortality. I'll say it again. Resurrection was and is the defeat of death. Resurrection is not just a nice, fancy description of death. It is something that reverses the effect of death. What's more, it's not something that happens at death. It's something that happens sometime after it, life after death life after death. Equally, I just want to put on the table a few of the small-scale arguments which are often and quite rightly advanced to support the belief that Jesus must have risen from the dead. The first one is Jewish tombs, especially the tombs of martyrs, were regularly venerated and often became shrines. People went and said prayers there. There is no, we know quite a bit about the early church. There is no sign whatever that anyone ever venerated Jesus' tomb, at least within the first couple of centuries. Of course, three or four centuries later, it was rediscovered, if it was, and a basilica was built over it conveniently, so you now, now can go and visit it if it really is the real one. Second, the early church's emphasis on the first day of the week as their special day is very hard to explain, granted their Jewish context, unless something striking really did happen then. If it was just a gradual dawning of faith over weeks and months and years, that wouldn't have been enough to kickstart a change in one of the most central symbolic features of Jewish life. Thirdly, a point which is often made, the disciples were hardly likely to go out and suffer and die for a belief that wasn't firmly anchored in fact. And all this brings us face to face with the ultimate question. The empty tomb and the meetings with Jesus are as well established by the argument I've advanced as any historical data could expect to be. And they are, in combination, the only possible explanation for the stories and beliefs that grew up so quickly among Jesus' followers. But how, in turn, do we explain them? Why was there an empty tomb? Why was there a meeting or several meetings with Jesus? In any other historical inquiry, the answer might seem so obvious that it would hardly need saying. Unfortunately, here, of course, the obvious answer, which is, of course, well, because it actually happened, is so shocking, so earth-shattering, that we rightly pause before leaping out into the unknown. So many misunderstandings have grown up at this point that it's impossible even to mention them here, let alone guard against them. And in addition, we do well to heed the warnings of those theologians who have cautioned against any attempt to stand on the ground of rationalism. We are just thinking reasonably, rational historical inquiry, and the attempt to prove in some mathematical fashion something which, if it happened, ought itself to be regarded as the center not only of history but also epistemology. In other words, not only of what we know about the past, but of how we know anything at all. If it's true, it must be like that. 
But granted that caution, to which I'll come back in a moment, all the historical signposts are pointing in the same direction. I and others have studied the alternative explanations, ancient and modern, for the rise of the early church and the shape of its belief. And far and away, the best historical explanation is that Jesus of Nazareth, having been very thoroughly dead and buried, really was raised to life on the third day with a renewed body, not, please note, a resuscitated corpse. People sometimes say, well, it, we don't believe in a resuscitated corpse, so it must have been something spiritual and non-bodily. That misses the point. We're not talking about the resuscitation of, of a corpse. We're talking about a new sort of bodily existence for which there was no precedent and of which there remains no subsequent example. That's very frustrating historically, but that is precisely what the accounts are trying to say. It was a new kind of physical body which left an empty tomb behind it because it has, as I said, used up the material of Jesus' original body and it possessed new properties which nobody had expected or imagined before, but which generated those significant mutations in the thinking of those who encountered it. If something like that happened, if, then that would perfectly explain why Christianity began, why it took the shape it did, why the early Christians believed what they did. Now at this point, the historian, insofar as she or he is a historian, finds themselves like the children of Israel beside the Red Sea. Behind are the forces of skepticism, saying we're coming to get you. Pharaoh's hordes, mocking and shouting. Ahead is the sea, representing chaos and death, forces which nobody is supposed to be able to beat. What are we to do? There is no way back. No other explanations have been offered in 2,000 years of sneering skepticism against the Christian witness that can satisfactorily account for how the tomb came to be empty, how the disciples came to see Jesus, and how their lives and worldviews were transformed. The alternative accounts are remarkably thin, and many of them are actually laughable. But history alone, certainly as conceived within the modern Western world, appears to leave us shivering on the seashore. It can press the question to which Christian faith gives an answer. But if someone chooses to stay between Pharaoh and the deep sea, I don't think history by itself can force them further. That's an important point. Everything then depends upon the context within which the history is being done. The most important decisions we make in life are not taken by post-enlightenment, left-brain rationality alone. Worldview issues are at stake here, and they are not to be dealt with by the old liberal strategy of pretending that to believe in the resurrection of Jesus is impossible for those who accept one, what one writer has called current paradigms of reality. If that means capitulating before the worldview of Hume and other Enlightenment thinkers, I reply that precisely now in the 21st century, there are all kinds of reasons for questioning those current paradigms. In any case, it's wrong, as we've seen, to imply that the choice is between an ancient worldview and a modern or even a postmodern one. The ancient worldview of Homer, Plato, Cicero, and all the rest knew perfectly well that resurrection didn't occur. Belief in resurrection isn't an ancient worldview which we in the modern period now must reject. It's a Jewish and more specifically a Christian view which ancient people and modern people find impossible to believe unless, unless, unless there really might be a God of creation and justice, a God who will set the world right, a God who will do new things and bring about new creation. You see, I don't want to give the impression that you can simply argue right up to the central truth of Christian faith by pure human reason, building on simple observation of the world. Indeed, it should be fairly obvious that you can't do that. Equally, I wouldn't suggest, as some do, that historical investigation of this sort has no part to play so that we can forget all the history I've been doing and simply take a blind leap of faith. No, God has given us minds to think. The question has been appropriately raised. How did Christianity begin and why did it take the shape it did? Christianity appeals to history and to history it must go. 
And the question of Jesus' resurrection, though it may in some senses burst the boundaries of history, also remains within them. And that is precisely why it is so important. It's so life and death. We could cope. The world could cope with a Jesus who ultimately remains a wonderful idea inside the disciples' minds and hearts. The world cannot cope with a Jesus who comes out of the tomb, with a Jesus who inaugurates God's new creation right in the middle of the old one. That is why for a complete approach, we have to locate our study of history within a larger complex of human, personal, and corporate settings. I am aware that for many people today, it is still assumed that faith lives in a private sphere, shutting itself off from history, lest history make unwelcome inroads. And for many others, history insists on running everything by a closed chain of visible cause and effect, which is never open to anything new happening. But what the Easter stories do is to pose a huge question. And we need to set our asking of that question, ultimately, in dialogue with the life of the community that believes the gospel and seeks by its life to live out its truth. We need to set it within the reading of the scriptures, which by their whole narrative lay out the worldview within which it does make sense. We need to think it through within a context of personal openness to the God of whom the Bible speaks, the creator of the world, not simply a divine presence within it, the God of justice and truth. These, please note, are not substitutes for historical inquiry, nor are they lame supplements to it, as though to say, well, history will take us so far, and then we need a God of the gaps to cover the last bit. That's not what I'm saying. These are ways of opening the windows of the mind and the heart to see what might really, after all, be possible within God's world, the world not only of creation as it is, but also of new creation. History, as I've said, brings us to the point where we are bound to say there really was an empty tomb, there really were sightings of Jesus, the same and yet transformed. And history then says, so how do you explain that? It offers, offers us no easy escapes, no quick side exits. They've all been tried and they, none of them work. History poses the question. And when Christian faith answers it, then a sober, humble, questioning history, as opposed to an arrogant rationalism that's already made its mind up, may find it saying, sounds good to me. The story of Thomas in John chapter 20 will serve as a parable for all of this. Thomas, like a good historian, wants evidence. He wants to touch and see. And Jesus presents himself to his sight and invites him to touch. But Thomas doesn't. He transcends the type of knowing that he thought he'd been going to use. And he passes into a higher and richer one, which brings history and faith together in a rush. My Lord, he says, and my God. Or take the story of Peter in John 21. Peter famously had denied Jesus three times. He had chosen to live within the normal world where tyrants win in the end and where it's better to dissociate yourself from nuisance-ish ideas that get you into trouble. But now with Easter, Peter is called to live in a different kind of world. And if Thomas is called to a new kind of faith, the question to Peter is, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Here I think of a remarkable line from that great philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. It is love that believes the resurrection. There is a whole world in that question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? A world of personal invitation and challenge, of the remaking of a human being from top to bottom after disloyalty and disaster of the refashioning of how we know things corresponding to the refashioning of reality in God's new creation. You see, the reality which the resurrection is cannot simply be known from within the old world of decay and denial of disloyalty and death. But that's the point. The resurrection is not, as it were, a highly peculiar event within the present world, though it is that as well. It is principally the defining, central, prototypical event of the new creation, the world which is born with Jesus. And if we are even to glimpse this new world, let alone enter it, we will need a different kind of knowing 
a knowing which involves us in new ways, an epistemology which draws out from us not just the cool appraisal of detached quasi-scientific research, but the whole person engagement and involvement for which the best shorthand is love in the full Johannine sense of agape. Now, the skeptic will at once complain that that's just collapsing the whole thing back into subjectivism and emotion once more, if it's love. Not so. Just because it takes agape to believe the resurrection, that doesn't mean that all that happened was that Peter and the others had their hearts strangely warmed. Precisely because it is love that we are talking about, it must have a correlated reality in the world outside the lover, or it isn't love. Love is the deepest mode of knowing because it is love that, while completely engaging with a reality which is other than itself, affirms and celebrates that other than self reality. And this is where our normal modernist epistemologies break down. And that is why, though the historical arguments for Jesus' bodily resurrection are very strong, we must never suppose that they will do more than bring people to the questions faced by Thomas and Peter, the questions of faith and love. We can't use a supposedly objective historical epistemology to beat people over the head and insist that they believe whatever else. To do so would be like someone who lit a candle to go and see whether the sun had risen yet. What the candles of historical scholarship will do is to show that the room has been disturbed, that it doesn't look like it did last night. Maybe we think after the historical arguments have done their work, maybe morning has come. Maybe the world has woken up and started doing things. But to investigate whether this is so, we must take the risk and open the curtains to the rising sun. And when we do so, we won't rely on the candles anymore. Not because we don't believe in evidence and argument, but because they will have been overtaken by the larger reality from which they borrow and to which they point. All knowing is a gift from God, historical not knowing no less than that of faith and love, but the greatest of these is love. I conclude with Oscar Wilde's wonderful scene in his play Salome, when Herod hears reports that Jesus of Nazareth has been raising the dead. Herod says, I do not wish him to do that. I forbid him to do that. I allow no man to raise the dead. This man must be found and told that I forbid him to raise the dead. There is the bluster of the tyrant who knows that his power is threatening. And I hear that same tone of voice today, not just in the politicians who want to carve up the world for their own advantage, but in the intellectual traditions that have gone along for the ride. Wilde's next haunting line is the real crunch. Where is this man? demands Herod. And the courtier replies, he is in every place, my lord, but it is hard to find him. And that is where we're left this evening. A Jesus who won't be nailed down by skepticism, who won't fit within the limiting worldviews of any particular age or culture, but who makes his presence felt in a thousand different ways and challenges us not only to belief but also to loyalty. Historical argument sharpens up the challenge. There is no other good explanation for the rise of early Christianity other than that Jesus of Nazareth was raised from the dead. But this leaves us with the personal and the social challenge about which I shall be speaking, I think, tomorrow morning and then Sunday. Are we prepared for what it will mean to do business not only with this Jesus, but with the God who, if indeed he was raised on the third day, has declared him to be his son, and now calls all people everywhere to follow him. My answer to the question, did Jesus really rise from the dead, is then an unqualified yes. But like all the best answers, this one turns out to contain another deeper question, and it's this, what are you going to do about it? Thank you. Let's let Bishop Wright get a little bit of a rest while I call the panelists up. Here's uh, um, 
um, time for Bishop Wright to field a few questions before we close. And these questions have been called from your questions. And let me introduce our panelists. First is Dr. Jennifer McLean, uh, who is Associate Professor of Religion here at Rona College, and Dr. David Delaney, the, the Reverend Dr. David Delaney, who is the Director for Youth and Young Adult Ministries in the, Virginia, in the Virginia Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. They have, have gotten a, a number of your questions. They have called them out, and uh, I will turn it over to them. The first question reads thus. Are there any objections to the historicity of the resurrection that you find difficult to answer? If so, how do you maintain certainty in the face of immeasurable, oh no, excuse me, unanswerable questions? There are always plenty of unanswerable questions, and one which I skipped over tonight, but which I've dealt with in much more detail in the big book, has to do with the correlation, which I did just mention, between the different accounts. This business of how many women went to the tomb at what point, and who did they meet, and where did the appearances happen. Now, those are not quite as difficult as has sometimes been made out, and there is some harmonizing that is possible, but I have tended to take the line, as I hinted, that many other writers have done, which is confirmed again and again by those who study the laws of evidence in police courts and so on, that if five people all see the same traffic accident and at once give an excited and breathless account to the policeman, or to different policemen, then you will find that those accounts do not exactly match up. But that doesn't mean there wasn't a traffic accident. It just means that people are trying to describe what they saw, and it's more complicated than you might have thought. Indeed, one of the things which was missed out from this lecture in my um, determination to get it down to nearly an hour, which it wasn't when I started today, was a wonderful scene from a book, book called Wittgenstein's Poker, which describes an incident which took place in a seminar in Cambridge when Wittgenstein brandished a poker from the fire, um, appearing to threaten the philosopher Karl Popper with it. And those present included some of the finest theological minds in the mid-20th century world, but none of them could agree afterwards about what exactly had happened, what order the events had taken place in, and so on. There's a whole book written about that. And so, I mean, this, this is how real life works, but if somebody skewers me and says, well, you can't tell me whether it was two women who went or one or what, then I'll put my hand up and say, no, I probably ultimately can't tell you that, but actually I don't think it matters, and I think, if anything, that rather strengthens the case for the breathless eyewitness theory. Next question. Um, as if on cue in preparation for your lectures, this business of the ossuary in Jerusalem has uh, come up and captured everybody's imagination. And uh, to combine that uh, comment that a number of people have made uh, with simply the, uh, the awareness, particularly during the 20th century, of all of these efforts to sort of do away with the resurrection, or at least try to somehow have Christianity without it, the question is, what's behind that? Why all the fervor? Why are people so excited about this, particularly when the ossuary is of such highly dubious yeah. uh, authenticity anyway? You, you all know what an ossuary is now. I mean, what, one of the great gains of all this is that we now all do know what ossuaries are because um, the newspapers and the television programs have reminded us. I, I, I didn't know any of that when I grew up. In fact, when I, as a little boy, heard about Jesus dying and being buried, I assumed he was put in a coffin in the earth like people were in the culture where I grew up. And so it was a surprise to discover this two-stage burial process. So that's all to the good. Um, the point about the ossuary, as I said, is that it was a two-stage burial, and if somebody had come back to do phase two, game over. That would have been finished right there. But then, uh, as the Jewish archaeologists will tell you, um, they found hundreds and thousands of ossuaries from roughly the period of Jesus. And if you go through a list, they've actually made up a thing like a telephone directory of all the names. And they didn't have many names in the first century. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of Jesuses, Josephs, Simons, Judas, and hundreds of Marys. They were even shorter on girls' names than they were on boys' names. So to find 
uh, an ossuary which has na or tomb which has names like Jesus, Joseph, Simon, Mary, Judah. Um, this is not a big deal. As I said to a newspaper reporter yesterday, this is like finding John and Mary Smith in the London telephone directory. You know, there's, there's going to be more than one of those. Um, and notice that the re reporter who was making a big song and dance about the ossuary that's just come to light now, I don't know that it's brand new, but anyway, um, was saying, don't you realize this proves that Jesus of Nazareth really existed? As though anyone actually doubted that. There's a lot of... You know, th there are people out there who genuinely don't know that it is accepted across the board by all except one or two completely out of line mavericks. Of course, Jesus of Nazareth really existed. So it's not a big deal about the Oscar. In terms of why people have been so frantically trying to disprove the resurrection, I said last night in a lecture, I'll repeat it. The worldview upon which we in Western society have been living for the last 200 years, give or take, this is a very broad brush, is a worldview which describes the progress of history up to the 18th century in Western Europe and North America when you get this great movement called the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment is the climax of history and everything that went before uh, is just superstition and ignorance and blindness. And now we are the enlightened ones and we have to implement the achievement of the Enlightenment with our science, our technology, our democracy, our progress with a capital P. Now, you see what's happened. The Enlightenment has its own eschatology reaching its peak in the 18th century. When, if I recall, certain countries um, did certain... Oh, let's not go there. Um, <laughs> Christianity tells a story in which world history came to its climax when Jesus of Nazareth came out of the tomb. Those two stories cannot both be true. Only one of them, or maybe neither, could be true. So it is part of the frantic attempt to shore up the Enlightenment worldview, particularly the worldview that says religion belongs over there and public life belongs over there. The whole point of the resurrection is that Jesus of Nazareth coming out of the tomb is neither a religious nor a political event, but something much bigger that includes both. And because the worldviews upon which your society and mine have lived haven't wanted to hear that, we have tried to hush up the resurrection, lest it blow the whistle on the source of quite a lot of our thinking about who we are and what we do. I'm going to consolidate this question a little bit. Um, the Gospel of Mark ends with um, the woman at the tomb uh, fleeing in fear and in silence. Uh, given that some of the other Gospel authors in the New Testament uh, continue on with stories of Jesus' appearance, and given what you've said about the importance of the resurrection for Christianity, what are, do we make, uh, what are we to make of Mark's ending of his gospel, leaving us unsure about whether Jesus was resurrected or not, and I might add, what that might mean? Yeah. Yeah. The ending of Mark's gospel has been a puzzle for a long time. If you look carefully at most printings of the Bible, you'll see that after Mark chapter 16, verse 8, there is then a longer ending, which it'll probably say in a footnote, this ending is not in the earliest manuscripts. There is still a squabble about uh, which manuscripts you follow, etc. Um, the ending of Mark at chapter 16, verse 8, remains very controversial, and there's a recent book, and I should have got the name in my head, and I'm sorry I don't, but you could find it um, if you went onto Amazon and just looked up under Ending of Mark, that's in the title, by a, a very, it's a very recent book by a scholar arguing extremely strongly and cogently that uh, Mark cannot have ended at verse 8 of chapter 16, and that there must have been a longer ending which is in fact now lost. Now, um, I have actually argued that in, in a kind of amateur way myself before that book came out. And if you look at the section on Mark in my book, The Resurrection of the Son of God, you'll see. Because you see, in the ancient world of, uh, of the time of Jesus, most books were not written uh, books like we have them today on leaves bound or stitched or, or glued together. They were written on scrolls. And if you go to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem and look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, you'll see that almost all of them are short of the beginning and the end because that's where the scroll is joined on to the piece of wood that it's, that it's stuck to. And so sooner or later, that's going to tear away and you'll get a truncated beginning and ending. The beginning of Mark actually is very jerky and and uneven as well, um, as anyone who studies it closely, particularly in the Greek, will see. And my best guess is that very, very early on, Mark lost its beginning and its ending. 
that's open to doubt, open to, to scholarly challenge, and that's fine. That's where the discipline has got to on that one. But in terms of what Marx says about the women saying nothing to anyone for they were afraid, I think the best way we can interpret that, because Matthew is actually following Mark very closely at this point, is that he means that to begin with, the women immediately didn't say anything then and there, which explains how the story didn't get out and about, but eventually they get to the disciples and they do tell them, but Mark is missing that. Now you can say that's harmonizing if you like, but if the text is actually broken off and fractured at that point, then that is as likely as, as, as any of the other explanations. Anyway, I've said more about that in the book if you want to look it up. Another uh, consolidation of several kinds of questions, but more having to do with uh, the relationship of the resurrection to, say, evangelism. Nobody has really used that word, but I think that's a fair summary of, of, of a way of asking, as we continue to be the church uh, and we continue to do, um, to, to do our outreach, say, in the specific task of bringing people to faith, what role should the proclamation of the resurrection have in your view? The resurrection is very, very central to the proclamation of the church. Obviously, no resurrection then, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, what's the point? If Christ is not raised, our faith is futile. We are still in our sins. Um, let us eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. What's the, what's the fuss, folks? Um, if there is no resurrection, then Judaism might still be true. Some form of paganism might well be true nothing very much might be true, but certainly Christianity wouldn't be true. So resurrection remains central. But let me say this, the resurrection of Jesus does not simply mean that we have a gospel which says to each one of you and everyone as individuals that you need to do business with the God who raised Jesus from the dead. That is true. What the resurrection says is that God's new creation has begun, that Jesus is the Lord of this new world and that Jesus summons people everywhere to believing allegiance. That's actually more or less a summary of Romans chapter 1 verses 1 to 5. And if that is so, this believing allegiance cannot be confined simply to what we call personal or individual faith. It's what happens when say in the old South Africa, when somebody like Desmond Tutu, in the name of Jesus, confronted the rulers of old South Africa with the fact that what they were doing was radically out of line with the new world that had been launched with Jesus' death and resurrection. That's just as much in that sense a preaching of the gospel because the gospel is not you can have a nice spirituality and an eventual salvation. The gospel is Jesus Christ is Lord. And the evidence for that is the resurrection. But when you say Jesus Christ is Lord, you not only call every individual to personal faith, you call every structure in society to respond to the fact that Jesus wants to be Lord of that structure as well. And so that's a massive task which contains the whole of the church's mission. Or let me put it like this. Older liberal theology in my country tended to work with a low Christology and a very high social agenda saying that Jesus was a great teacher, we're not sure if he was the son of God, and we're pretty sure he didn't rise bodily from the dead, but what matters now is housing the homeless, feeding the poor, sorting out the political problems of the world. My answer to that is, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, what makes you think you're going to have any success taking on the principalities and powers of the world? Just because you shout a bit louder or have a slightly better program for twisting people's arms in politics doesn't mean you're actually going to solve the problems. But if Jesus rose from the dead, then there is an ontological grounding for what we do working for his kingdom in the present. God's new world has begun, and when we go to work with the poor and the disadvantaged and the homeless or whatever it is, we are actually not whistling in the dark. We are building on a foundation which has already been laid. So, an agenda for mission. One of the members of the audience echoes what you said at one point. He writes, or she writes, I've always said women were the first evangelists because the women are the ones that first spoke of his raising from the dead. Another member of the audience asks, my dad thinks that the author of Luke Acts was a woman. Is he a complete natter or what? <laughs> Sadly, it is highly unlikely 
that a woman in the first century would have been able to write the Greek of Luke Acts. I'm not saying it's impossible, um, but just in terms of education, education tended to be a male thing, which is another reason, of course, why women weren't considered credible witnesses, because they were regarded as uneducated, ignorant, um, etc., etc. So, though some people have suggested that maybe one or more of the New Testament documents might have been written by a woman, I have yet to be convinced simply in terms of what I think we know about the education of women in that world. As I say, I'm not saying that some women couldn't have broken through that barrier, but that was a pretty tough barrier. Um, but the first part of the question was more about... Um, uh, women uh, being the first evangelists. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, I, I think it's absolutely true, and it's, it's part, of the, part of the glory of the gospel, that the gospel is... And this is, this is why I'm concerned not to give the impression that by clever or powerful historical argument, one can bludgeon people into submission. It's not like that. The, the, the gospel can be uh, argued through and thought through and it'll stretch your mind as far as you can go and further. But ultimately, the message of the gospel is conveyed with the strange weakness and foolishness of which Paul speaks. Um, that, 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 that please God by the foolishness of our preaching to save those who believe. And the foolishness of that preaching begins with frightened, almost hysterical women running off and saying, oh, we think he's been raised from the dead. And of course the disciples say, don't be so stupid, you're out of your mind. And it wasn't long before the enemies of Christianity said, oh, your story, it's just based on the testimony of some women who uh, had, a, had a fright in a graveyard and got all hysterical about it, so you needn't believe that. And the early Christians went on telling that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John story. So yes, women as the first apostles and evangelists. This will be our last question uh, for the evening. Um, we live in a part of the world uh, here where uh, people are very, very enamored of uh, things that were represented, at, say, in the Left Behind series, uh, fascination with the rapture and, and that kind of eschatology. And a couple of our questions have asked what difference uh, uh, the, this kind of understanding of the centrality of resurrection makes in our viewpoint about things like, for example, the rapture or that whole end of Christian thought mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. eschatology. Thank you, yes. Um, I shall, I think, be saying a little bit about that tomorrow, but by no means all of you I know will be at the sessions tomorrow morning. Um, I'm not an expert on rapture theology, but I've read quite a bit of that stuff over the years and have been around that discussion. It seems to me that the, the rapture theory, as normally conceived, tries to base itself on a couple of verses towards the end of 1 Thessalonians 4, but reads them out of context and puts them into a framework of thought which is strictly speaking a dualistic framework in which the name of the game is to leave earth behind and go to heaven instead. Whereas the whole point of the last scene in the book of Revelation, Revelation 21, is not that people are going up from earth to heaven, as in the so-called rapture, but that the new Jerusalem is coming down from heaven to earth. The rapture theology gets its mileage particularly, as I was saying last night in a lecture, from that implicit gnosticism which regards the world as a shabby or bad or dangerous place and sees the point of religion as being to escape the world. But the whole point of Jesus' teaching and proclamation, the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Prayer, is that God's kingdom shall come and his will be done on earth as in heaven. And at the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He doesn't say, I'm off to heaven and the sooner you can come and join me, the better. That's not how it works. <laughs> and, in, and in 1 Thessalonians 4, Jesus will appear, and Paul is, Paul is doing three things in 1 Thessalonians 4, echoing, on the one hand, Moses coming down the mountain, the blast of the trumpet and so on. Um, on the other hand, Caesar coming to a town or city, part of his empire, and the citizens going out to meet him somewhere outside the town because they wouldn't just stay in town waiting for him. 
That would be very impolite and perhaps politically dangerous. And thirdly, he's echoing Daniel chapter 7. Now, Paul does this. Paul mixes his metaphors. He takes different images and he shoves them together. In the next chapter, in 1 Thessalonians 5, he warns people uh, that the thief is coming in the night, so the woman is going to go into labor, so you mustn't um, get drunk, but must stay awake and put on your armor. Now... <laughs> So when he says that there is coming a time when it'll, it'll be a bit like Moses coming down the mountain and the people looking up to see him. It'll be a bit like Daniel 7, the son of man coming up on the clouds. And it'll be a bit like Caesar arriving at a city. We shouldn't expect to get a woodenly literal historical picture out of that. And the point about the parousia, about the royal appearance of Caesar with, uh, at a town, is that the citizens go out to meet him. We go to meet the Lord in the air. Whatever Paul thought would be the objective correlate of that. Not in order to stay there, but in order to escort Caesar or whoever it is back into the town. So even if you want to take First Thessalonians 4 moderately literally, then you would have to say that the reason for meeting the Lord is not to stay away up in heaven, but in order to escort him to the place which is his by right, which is this earth. And with that, I've basically deconstructed, I think, the worldview within which the rapture uh, gets its, gets its uh, emphasis. And it seems to me that a fully biblical eschatology has to talk not about that, but about the new heavens and the new earth, the new creation, which is our birthright as Christians, and over the whole of which Jesus is Lord. Let me apologize that there's been probably a thousand more questions that I haven't had a chance to uh, answer, and let me say a plea, please don't email me with them, because if you do, if you do, I probably won't be able to answer them. I'm sorry, but thank you very much anyway. Thank you. Please hold your applause for just a second. And we at Rona College want to give you, Bishop Wright, a gift, which we'd like you to take out and maybe show here. If you could pull that out. What is this? And pull it up. It, oh, my goodness. This is a throw, a Rona College throw, <laughs> that you can take with you to keep warm back in chilly England. And, and actually... We will ship it home so you won't have to take it. But let me just say that you have been a tremendous crowd. Uh, uh, sitting all this long time on those hard bleacher seats, we really appreciate your coming. We want you to look at the tremendous books, the book table at the back on your way out, and, and uh, um, good evening. <laughs>